Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Riga Siakiris, and I will be the moderator of this new event uh, with the theme Agroforestry and Asian Forest Protection. This webinar will take place in English, but there is also a translation in German. Uh, I, unfortunately, the moderator, uh, Anna, is, uh, has not the opportunity to, to do this because she's a little bit uh, ill, so I will uh, make the moderation and I will give the talk to Dagmar, who say, will say some small introductory talk uh, about the topic and then we will come in with the other speakers. So, Dagmar. Would you say some words to us? Many thanks, Eurigas. Es ist der Bolli. Einen wunder, wunderschönen guten Abend, späten Nachmittag, von wo immer Sie hier uns zuschaut und zuhört. Mein Name ist Dagmar Tutschek. Ich bin die Obfrau von Freda, der Grünen Zukunftsakademie. Das ist die Parteiakademie der Grünen in Österreich. Ich darf euch heute sehr herzlich begrüßen nicht nur im Namen der Freda, sondern auch der Green European Foundation, gemeinsam und gemeinsam mit unseren griechischen Kooperationspartnerinnen äh, haben wir diese Veranstaltung heute organisiert. Diese Veranstaltung ist eingebettet in ein größeres, mehrjähriges Projekt. Jeff liegt es sehr am Herzen, solche transnationalen Projekte zu unterstützen und voranzubringen. Der große Überbegriff für dieses Projekt lautet Deforestation und Climate Change. Und das heutige Thema ist sehr spezifisch abgestimmt auf die Situation in Griechenland. Wir hatten vor einigen Monaten einen sehr spannenden Auftakt zusammen mit Rumänien, wo es in erster Linie darum ging, was dort, an, ich sage es jetzt ganz prononciert auf Deutsch, Grauslichkeiten passieren illegale Abholzungen in den letzten Urwäldern Europas. Und wir haben uns auch angeschaut, welche Rolle hier unrühmlicherweise auch Firmen aus Österreich spielen. Unser nächster Fokus ist jetzt in Griechenland, wo sich unsere Kolleginnen sehr intensiv Gedanken gemacht haben, wie man eine nachhaltige Forstwirtschaft mit einer guten kleinräumigen Landwirtschaft verbinden kann. Darüber hören wir heute viel und ich freue mich sehr, dass wir auch einen Europaparlamentarier hier haben, der einen der Inputs halten wird. Der nächste Schritt in unserem Projekt wird dann sein, Best-Practice-Beispiele äh, wieder zurück nach Österreich. Und ich freue mich sehr, möglichst viele von euch dann zu uns einladen zu dürfen. Wir setzen schon sehr darauf, dass im Herbst das Reisen wieder möglichst frei erlaubt sein wird und euch bei uns begrüßen zu dürfen. Und jetzt darf ich an Adrian übergeben, Adrian Todt, mein Kollege von der Green European Foundation. Er wird euch auch noch ein paar ganz, ganz nützliche Hinweise für den Ablauf dieser Konferenz heute geben. Vielen Dank, Adrian, und uns allen eine gute und spannende Diskussion. Thank you very much, Dagmar. Hello, everybody. My name is Adrian. I'm from the Green European Foundation, one of the three project coordinators here. As Dagmar mentioned, this is a, a two-year project. The second year, last year, we started off with indeed focusing on deforestation in Romania. And this year, uh, together with our Austrian partners, Freda and the Greek Green Institute, we will be focusing on agroforestry and ancient forest protection. There is already a large interest in this topic and over 120 participants signed up. I would like to start off with a few technicalities before we dive into the speeches. Indeed, on your right hand side, this event is uh, in English as well as simultaneous translation in German. Uh, chat box is, um, is announced already, and you can put your questions uh, there for all the speakers. Um, and now I would like to hand it over to Rikas, our Greek colleague, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Andrian. Uh, this is a very unique uh, combination of forces, let's say. The 
North uh, European countries with the uh, intensity of the forest production of uh, a focusing especially on timber and uh, the North South European countries, which uh, are uh, in uh, not so wealthy countries, but their forestry sector is also very small, but very unique uh, considering biodiversity issues. So I will start uh, the, my, present, my introduction on uh, the, uh, as, a, as a, I'm a forest ecologist and I'm a member of the scientific committee of the Green Institute Greece. And we started uh, this small idea of uh, pre presenting some best practice examples that uh, are not only important for our country, but could have also uh, um, applica uh, applicable ideas in the whole European continent. Therefore, uh, uh, I will present also uh, the, the results of uh, our three events, which I will uh, say in depth in a, in a few minutes, what has been done by our institution so far. So the general idea behind this is that uh, the most threatened landscapes, forest landscapes in the EU are the ASEAN forests. But ASEAN forests are not always in the remote areas. Sometimes they are nearby us. And this is especially the, the, the issue the, in forest landscapes in the south of Europe where million, where many areas and uh, many ASEAN trees are combined with landscapes that we say these are agroforestry landscapes that are preserved through the low intensity farming activities. Those ASEAN trees and ASEAN forests sometimes are, uh, they, we say that they are wood pastures or uh, are um, combined uh, agricultural activities with forest activities, we say that these are landscape multifunctional landscapes and that are, these landscapes are very resilient in climate change, of course, because they have persisted for thousands of years. On the other hand, these landscapes are the most threatened ones. These are, landscapes are very uh, uh, are uh, uh, are not any more uh, economically viable, and these are uh, deserted, abandoned, and especially in the Mediterranean region, uh, when we uh, we abandon this landscape, flammable new shrublands and forests are coming up because this uh, biomass is not taken either by grazing animals, not by cleaning up this uh, vegetation, by uh, plowing the, 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 the fields, etc. But uh, also, so they are abandoned and they are threatened by mega fires, which are the result of, of course of climate change. On the other hand, the intensification of land use, like you said, in Austria or in Ukraine, uh, are also threatening this ASEAN forest because of uh, the, the intensification of land use. So we have this dipolo, this uh, abandonment on the, other, on, the un, on the one side and intensification of land use in the other. So the, the, the other thing is that the EU launched a very ambitious goal in reply, of planting 3 billion trees uh, until 2030 in order to tackle the problem with emissions of, uh, of uh, CO2 and that money could be taken from the private sector in order to uh, compensate a little bit the problems that uh, industries and other uh, activities could uh, damage the climate. So this idea is a very attractive also for the private sector, but do we need only to reforest areas or we could we also combine forces in order to implement other strategic issues for the policy of EU, like a Biodiversity Act, also like the 17 goals of sustainable development, or the need for tackling the desertification, or the problem of creating new jobs after the COVID-19 era. 
So um, our idea as a Green uh, Institute, it was a, a retro innovative idea of, uh, of, of uh, launching an initiative which we uh, name as reproductive reforestation. What is reproductive reforestation is an initiative that combines the reforestation, so creating new forest in the areas where forest existed, afforestation, which is creating a forest in areas that doesn't exist, a forest never exists, and planting trees. So these three, three pylons of planting, let's say, trees could be done in a way that could uh, create multi, uh, for, multi-task, multifunctional forest, but also preserving uh, ancient landscape, protecting agroforestry system, and uh, bringing more, let's say, uh, products in the market, creating more jobs, and in the same time protecting the ancient forest from the wood demand. Uh, we call, we made uh, therefore three events. Uh, the three events uh, had to do with what is uh, productive reforestation, what is this idea, and that are about the desertification and the, um, uh, the new fund, uh, which is about the resilience and the recovery fund. And we asked, uh, uh, we invited some speakers and we combine all this current scientific knowledge of these invited speakers, which they were from academies, institutions, NGOs, etc. And we produced this book that I will present to you in a, in a minute, which will be, a, which we wanted to be a book of guidelines for the policy makers also and for the wider public. So our book uh, is, uh, I will share my screen now. And uh, this is our book. If you see it, I don't know. Do you see uh, my screen now? Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, is, uh, the title is Productive Reforestation for Living Rural Landscapes. And uh, the topic is uh, how we can create jobs and reviving agroforestry systems that sustained many, many years, thousands of years for livestock farming also, for agriculture, for beekeeping, and for the biodiversity while tackling desertification, erosion, and mitigating the effects of climate change. Uh, this is uh, uh, the product of uh, also a scientific committee that uh, we, we, we are working in as a team for producing this in a very short period, in two months only. And uh, this is our small logo, which is about, uh, you know, the bee and the, the goat and the, the, the Asian tree. And this is the book of the proceedings. So these are the, uh, our invited speakers, are 20 people. And uh, clicking in this icon, you can, you can find also the presentation of each speaker. So this is a characteristic example of ancient uh, forest in Greece, open, far, open wood pasture in Xiromero area. Anastasia Bandera will speak about this uh, special issue. And here Elias Yaniris, uh, the president of our institution, uh, uh, said about sm a small uh, greeting about what is the, uh, the, the, the purpose of our, uh, our, our goal. So I also make an introduction saying about these unique landscapes and uh, uh, how we can tackle biodiversity crisis and uh, global uh, uh, climate change, uh, change uh, problems with the reforestations and uh, how we can create jobs and how we can involve local people in that. So this I will escape now and to show you the how, okay, sorry. Do you see again? Eh, the, this yes, is, yes, okay. Yeah, this is the, the way we present our work. This is the, the invitation card of the first event. And here it was the Majanas, the first talk. It was by him and explained what is agroforestry and this mixture of uh, land uses and creating new, but also preserving the old ones. 
Also, Panagiotis Sanatoudis said about the saving of local varieties and how we uh, can exchange uh, seeds and how this, uh, he held one of the biggest uh, uh, seed festivals of the world and uh, how important it is to preserve the Asian varieties. Whereas um, Sophia Gunnari said about the beekeeping and the importance of beekeeping in the forest landscapes. The beekeeping is uh, uh, crucial for preserving the biodiversity there. As also Nikos, Nikishiani said about uh, uh, invite us to see this important, hugely uh, abundant landscapes of the mountains of Greece, where ancient races of uh, fruit trees can be uh, can be a potential for exploitation, and uh, they can create, like uh, Malupa said here, new new clones of uh, berries and trees that are. Uh, adapted in a uh, in, uh, local environment, could be resilient in climate change and could uh, produce innovative products and can be used all for so reforestation, afforestation and planting. The second event, it was about desertification. You see characteristic example of desertification in the islands. And we, we had uh, Dr. Yasoglu. Yasoglu is one of the very uh, famous in Greece professors because he was the first to invent the, the, the National Commission of against uh, desertification. He pointed out how important it is to have action plan in, uh, in, in the country and also in, in Greece. While Panagiotis uh, Panago said about the, con the conclusions of the European uh, Court and he said about the importance of uh, having uh, a joint forces about all strategies that uh, have to do with um, the uh, European policy about the uh, strategy of the climate change strategy and also to take uh, uh, the desertification issue um, uh, in, uh, in account. Uh, also, Christo Chardilla said about the intensification of land uses and uh, how you see, uh, as you see here, in the, the, the agricultural sector and how this is very, very uh, uh, threatful for the agriculture, uh, for the uh, soil and the productivity in general, while uh, Dr. Kaliva said about the prioritization and how we can use the modern technology to implement uh, the, the, the measures we need uh, 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 as fast as possible in most areas. Dr. Parpanastasi said about the rangeland and how they have been deserted and how they can be uh, used and um, sustainable while uh, Yanis Kazoglu said about the local races and uh, how they can be used to tackle the problems of uh, sustainable management of rangeland. While uh, Dr. Petanidus said about uh, uh, how we can use these uh, terraces, the stone wall, ter wall terraces that uh, are uh, in a huge area in the islands, uh, we trade, how we can treat them as a barrier for climate change and how we can say that these are green infra infrastructure that have to be preserved and revived. Whereas the last event was about the resilient and the recovery fund and uh, uh, Dr. Kizo said about the cap policies and how they can preserve or destroy these Asian landscapes. While uh, Dr. Haji Yoryu said about the importance of local seed varieties to revive the grasslands and uh, also the Dr. D'Alessios said about the priorities, how to identify this agroclimatic zoning. And um, uh, Dr. Petanidou said about the genetic diversity of forest, uh, of forest and uh, forest species and how we have to make nurseries with local varieties of uh, uh, genetic local varieties of uh, wild uh, forest species, while Perry Kurakli said about the national strategy of uh, uh, forest strategy, which, which has been launched uh, in 2018, and how we can uh, 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 how we can commence with this. And uh, the, Dr. Kakuro said about the. Um, the history of the forestry service and how difficult it was in this landscape to create these multifunctional landscapes in the past, and how we have to have a new Mediterranean smart uh, smart forestry 
Mediterranean forestry in order to tackle the new problems. Lastly, uh, Emilia Drugas said about the importance of uh, uh, identify the globally important agricultural heritage systems and how the new agriculture policy could develop this, uh, this point of view and how this uh, uh, tool could uh, be used as uh, to, to, to find out new areas and to identify priority actions. Then, lastly, I will give you the chance to read uh, and to see from Jeff's uh, website also the summary and conclusion. We have here a, a long uh, text uh, that uh, has many uh, implement uh, many recommendations and uh, actions to be implemented and policy prioritization. And uh, this is, uh, let's say, the combining uh, result of all the, uh, the issues before. And lastly, you can find everything uh, in the press release, etc., in Greek language, of course, uh, in the last page. That's all from my part, and uh, I, I hope uh, it was interesting. And now I have to give the um, the I I no I I will. Uh, start um, I, I want to uh, stop sharing and give the talk to our next invited speaker who is uh, Martin Heusling, MP from the European Parliament. We are very pleased to have him with us and he will give a, a talk about the common agriculture policy and the traditional forms of agriculture. I know, I know that he he knows this uh, this issue very much uh, in depth because he is also an agriculturalist uh, and the product uh, on. Uh, on biological products, yes, if I am right. So I'm very pleased to hear and also our participants to hear his point of view on the, on this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, so Martin, you have the space now. Yeah, vielen herzlichen Dank erstmal für die Einladung. In der Tat, ich bin, ich bin sagen, in meinem vorigen Leben bin ich auch Landwirt gewesen. Den Betrieb machen jetzt meine Söhne weiter. Und wie das sich bei uns in Hessen, ich komme aus der Mitte Deutschlands, gehört, hatten wir nicht nur Landwirtschaft, sondern auch immer ein Stück Forstwirtschaft. Aber da fängt das nämlich schon an, die Problematik gemeinsamer Agrarpolitik und Forstwirtschaft, weil das ist bei uns ganz scharf getrennt. Da gibt es Wald und da gibt es Landwirtschaft. Und da gibt es kaum sozusagen äh, Mischsysteme, die im Grunde genommen ja eigentlich sinnvoll wären. Zurzeit, ähm, und das ist meine zweite Agrarreform, die ich im Parlament mache, verhandeln wir über die Verteilung von insgesamt 387 Milliarden Euro für die nächsten sieben Jahre. Und ähm, ich sage mal so, die Hoffnung stirbt zuletzt, aber normalerweise ist es so, dass sich eher diese Agrarpolitik orientiert an einem Standardmodell mitteleuropäische Landwirtschaft, Betriebe, die sozusagen keine Mischformen haben, sondern das ist ganz klasse. There is no English translation. Ich hoffe, es geht. Das dass sozusagen sich das orientiert eher einer eine auf Weltmarkt ausgerichteten Landwirtschaft mit immer größerer Produktivität, äh, nicht mit äh, Kleinbauern beschäftigt man sich relativ wenig. Das ist leider so, sondern ganz im Gegenteil. Wenn ich mir so manche Kollegen im Agrarausschuss anhöre oder auch Länder Agrarminister sind, sind Landwirtschaft, Wirte, die unter 10 Hektar sind, eher Auslaufmodelle, die die Agrarstruktur ja behindern, weil man den, den, der Meinung ist, das Ganze müsse alles unheimlich produktiv sein. Und deshalb äh, ist sozusagen schon mal die allgemeine Ausrichtung der gemeinsamen Agrarpolitik auf einen echten falschen Weg. Ähm, und 
dass man dann auch noch Förderung gibt oder in manchen Ländern Förderung geben will, dass Betriebe aufhören, um angeblichen Generationenwechsel zu erzeugen, zeigt, dass man in vielen Bereichen äh, auf dem Weg ist, diese traditionellen Strukturen, die kleinen Betriebe eher vom Markt wegzudrängen, anstatt ihnen eine entsprechende Möglichkeit zu geben. Und das liegt immer noch daran, in erster Linie, weil das Fördersystem danach ausgerichtet ist, auf, auf die Hektar. Also 60 Prozent der Zahlungen, da wird sich auch nicht viel dran ändern, gehen in die Förderung von Hektaren. Hast du viele Hektar, kriegst du viel Geld. Hast du wenig Hektar, kriegst du halt nichts. Ich sage immer spaßhalber, bei uns äh, für den Großbetrieb in Ostdeutschland mit 1000 Hektar, der kann sich am Jahresende von der Förderung der EU einen neuen Schlepper kaufen und für die anderen reicht es nicht für den Sprit, für die kleinen Betriebe. Deshalb äh, ist es tatsächlich so, dass wir dringend eine Neuausrichtung bräuchten. Und wir haben auf der anderen Seite letztes Jahr verabschiedet im Europäischen Parlament die Forststrategie. Auch die läuft eigentlich in Richtung produktive schnell maschinell erntbare, abzuerntende Wälder für die Holzproduktion. Das orientiert sich auch eher an nordischen Wäldern und gar nicht an traditionellen südeuropäischen Forstwäldern und schon gar nicht an Wäldern, die sagen, an, an Landschaften, die eine Doppelnutzung haben. Auch da läuft es falsch. Man muss aber zur Entschuldigung sagen, diese Forststrategie ist eine Strategie der Europäischen Union, Forstpolitik als solche, ist Sache der Nationalstaaten. Da hat also die Europäische Union relativ wenig mit zu tun. Was wir jetzt bräuchten, und dazu besteht ja durchaus auch die Chance in der, in der neuen GAP, dass wir die Förderung neu ausrichten. Da soll es jetzt ein neues Modell geben, das nicht mehr nur die Hektare zählt, sondern auch die, das Ergebnis der Förderung. Und dazu gehört Förderung der Biodiversität, Förderung der, äh, des Klimanutzens, und deshalb sind jetzt Systeme wie die Agroforesty, äh, jetzt könnt ihr mal das einspeisen, was ich als Folien vorbereitet habe, ist jetzt plötzlich auf der Agenda und eines der vier Maßnahmen, die jetzt äh, gefördert werden sollen in der ersten Säule äh, im Rahmen von, von dem sogenannten neuen Eco-Schemes. Äh, wenn jetzt die Präsentation käme, wäre es ganz gut. Ich rede mal weiter, weil 30 Prozent der Agrarförderung soll jetzt in der ersten Säule äh, anhand von freiwilligen Umweltleistungen passieren. Und eines dieser Modelle, die dann gefördert wird, ist dann auch die Agroforst-Methode. Man muss sagen, in vielen Ländern, wie auch in meinem Land in Deutschland, ist das eine Methode, die bis vor kurzem überhaupt nicht überhaupt noch nicht, äh, danke, überhaupt noch nicht auf der Agenda stand. Äh, man hat sogar äh, das gar nicht gefördert, weil man dann angefangen hat, und das ist ja auch kein Witz, das ist ja tatsächlich so, man hat äh, dann angefangen zu zählen, wie viele Bäume dürfen auf einem Hektar stehen, damit es noch genutzt werden kann als, als Wiese. Oder wie viel müssen denn abgeholzt werden, damit das noch in Agrarförderprogramme äh, passt und man hatte die Agroforstlandwirtschaft gar nicht, äh, gar nicht auf dem Schirm. Und das hat man jetzt, Gott sei Dank, will man das ändern, sodass also Agrarforstsysteme im Grunde genommen Bestandteil werden können, können weil die Maßnahmen sind ja freiwillig von jedem, äh, von jedem Mitgliedsland, dass diese Agrarforstlandwirtschaft auch gefördert wird auch als Schwerpunkt gefördert wird, wenn es das Mitgliedsland anbietet. Wir alle wissen, und das ist ja eben auch deutsch geworden, hat einen hohen Effekt für Biodiversität. Und das Ziel der neuen GAP soll ja auch eine Förderung von Biodiversität sein. Wir wissen alle, dass es eine erhöhte Schutz vor Erosion hat. Wir hatten in, vor mehreren Jahren in Deutschland viele Tote auf einer Autobahn, weil ein Sandsturm in Deutschland, ja, in Deutschland, sagen Sie, Sicht versperrt hat und die Autos ineinander gerast sind, weil man Flächen in der Größenordnung von 100 Hektar am Stück hatte, wo dann der Staub aufgewirbelt wurde. Das kann man vermeiden mit einer vernünftigen äh, Anpflanzung von, von Forst, von Waldflächen, also oder auch Streifen von Forst und die auch nutzen. Und deshalb ist das ein Punkt, der ganz wichtig ist. Dazu kommt natürlich der Aufbau von Humus, von langfristigen Humus und nicht nur kurzfristigen Humus. 
Und das Ganze hat natürlich auch was zu tun, dass dadurch durch diese Wurzeln, durch das langfristige Festlegen am Ende auch ähm, der Nährstoffkreislauf zugänglich ist besser zugänglich wird und der Wasserkreislauf besser ist. Also all diese Geschichten sind eigentlich in der Wissenschaft seit langem bekannt und seit langem auch Bestandteil von vielen Diskussionen. Nur sie haben bisher nie in irgendeinen Fördertatbestand gepasst. Und das müssen wir jetzt dringend ändern. Sechste bitte. Und ich denke, deshalb ist es auch so wichtig, dass man diese Förderung jetzt auch einbringt. Was wo viele Bauern, halt gerade in Mitteleuropa, das kritisch sehen, ist ja, ja gut, wir haben unsere Flächen in den letzten Jahren rationalisiert für große Techniken. Man sieht es mit so Mähdreschern, fährt man halt lieber gerne 100 Hektar am Stück ab, anstatt zwischen Bäumen zu kurven. Das ist richtig, aber es geht auch, wenn man entsprechend guten Willen hat und wenn man eine Förderung danach ausrichtet, dass dann ein Bauer, der diese Förderung auch in Anspruch nimmt, mehr Geld bekommt als jemand, der, der gar nichts macht. Und deshalb ist es äh, tatsächlich so, dass das ein Riesenschritt nach vorne wäre, um sozusagen auch vor allem was für die Biodiversität und Schutz der Umwelt zu tun. Äh, wie gesagt, Deutschland hat es jetzt äh, in den in neuen nationalen Strategieplänen jetzt auch untergebracht, was wir jetzt, glaube ich, in erster Linie mal brauchen, weil wir in vielen Regionen in Europa nicht mehr traditionelle Formen von Agroforst haben, dass wir die Bauern wieder schulen und den Bauern auch die Vorteile des Systems ein Stück weit auch wieder nahe bringen, weil viele Bauern erstmal sehr skeptisch sind. Man hat, und das ist ja wirklich so, in Deutschland hat man das in vielen anderen Ländern auch Flurbereinigung genannt. Das heißt, man hat in den, im vorigen Jahrhundert, in den 70er, 80er Jahren noch Flächen begradigt, hat Bäume und Hecken runtergenommen, damit große Einheiten entstehen. Und jetzt kommt sozusagen dieselbe Verwaltung und sagt, ja, ihr müsst ja wieder Hecken und Bäume pflanzen. Das ist für viele Bauern erstmal nicht nachvollziehbar. Deshalb müssen wir das auch den Bauern nahebringen. Nächste. Und ich denke, dass man auch das verbinden kann, auch in Südeuropa mit Systemen, wo man ganz deutlich sagen kann, da gibt es ja viele Beispiele, die wir in vielen anderen Ländern auch übertragen können. Und äh, das ist, wie gesagt, jetzt, und da bin ich gespannt, wir haben nächste Woche äh, die höchstwahrscheinlich die Schlussverhandlungen, ob die Kommission einen Vorschlag macht, äh, der ganz klar das in den Vordergrund stellt, das als Maßnahme auch speziell fördert. Also es geht auch darum, dass jetzt das auch mit einer Anreizkomponente ausgestattet wird und dass die Mitgliedstaaten auch nach diesem neuen Fördermodell dann auch greifen. Und dann kann man auch sozusagen alte Anlagen, wie, wie hier zu sehen mit den Olivenbäumen, die kann man auch tatsächlich erhalten und muss sich nicht, muss nicht dann darum kämpfen, in welchem Bereich der Förderung das jetzt passt, sondern das kann man ganz gezielt über beide Maßnahmen, erste Säule, zweite Säule in der Agrarförderung auch integrieren. Weiter. Und ähm, ja, der Vorteil ist, und wir hatten eine Veranstaltung mit Herrn Timmermans äh, der, und haben ihm das auch erklärt an dem Punkt, wo man dann auch in Deutsch gesagt haben, das ja, wäre doch, wär doch gut, wenn man diese Agrarforstmethoden äh, jetzt implementiert und die Bauern dafür belohnt Strategien ein. In die Natura 2000 Strategie, in European Sustainable Development Strategy, in das Klimaprogramm passt es rein, es passt in die Forststrategie. Und das sind alles Geschichten, Kork 1 und 2, ich würde jetzt wenigen was sagen, aber das ist die Entwicklung der ländlichen Räume. Da gab es zwei große Konferenzen. Und deshalb könnte man auch wirklich daraus Modellprojekte gestalten, wo gerade Länder in Südeuropa ein Vorbild sein können. Ich muss selber zugeben, als jemand, der in einer Landschaft lebt, wo das traditionell seit vielen Jahren nicht mehr der Fall ist, wäre es, glaube ich, ganz gut. Man würde das sozusagen aus Griechenland oder auch aus Rumänien übertragen und kann man sagen, die Vorteile, die da deutlich geworden sind in den letzten Jahren, traditionelle Formen von Landwirtschaft, kann man jetzt sozusagen zum Modell entwickeln. Das wäre mal ein echter Shift. Das wäre mal echt äh, eine echte Wende in der gemeinsamen Agrarpolitik, weil man wegkäme von diesem Wegrationalisieren 
sondern dass plötzlich traditionelle Formen der Landwirtschaft kombiniert mit einer vernünftigen Forstwirtschaft jetzt plötzlich zum einen Modellcharakter haben äh, für, für eine andere Form von Landwirtschaft. Timmermann selber hat ja in der farm to fork strategie gesagt, drei Milliarden Bäume für Europa. Das ist eine gute Idee, aber die sollten wir nicht alle nur in, im Wald, sagen in der Definition, Definition Wald äh, pflanzen, sondern die sollten wir auch in der Agrarlandschaft unterbringen. Und äh, ich freue mich gerade hier, nächste Folie, ich freue mich gerade hier, dass wir tatsächlich dieses Jahr mal kein Wasserproblem haben, äh, sondern dass es dieses Jahr bei uns relativ feucht ist. Aber letztes Jahr um die Zeit hatten wir hier, und das war die dritte Trockenheit hintereinander, äh, Verhältnisse, äh, die hier keiner kannte, wo also wirklich schon im, das Wachstum Ende Mai aufgehört hat und wir eine Trockenheit hatten, wie sie seit Generationen nicht bekannt war, und das drei Jahre hintereinander. Das zeigt, dass wir dringend Agrarsysteme anpassen müssen. Und deshalb hoffe ich, das ist nach wie vor ja noch alles offen, deshalb hoffe ich, dass man diese Chance ergreift, sowohl in den Mitgliedsländern, aber auch, dass die Kommission die Chance ergreift, das als Standard zu implementieren und dass wir auch mal aufhören zu sagen, und das wäre das wär noch ein wichtiger Punkt, diese scharfe Trennung von Wald und Ackerland aufzuheben. Ich weiß, dass es da immer noch viele gibt in den Verwaltungen, die da ein Problem mit haben. Also die österreichischen Kollegen wissen, dass es in Österreich vor ein paar Jahren mal eine, eine Untersuchung gab auf den Almen, dass dann plötzlich jemand kam und hat gesagt, ja, es ja, ist ja schön und gut, das sind ja 30 Hektar, aber da ist ja ein Stein und da steht ein Baum und da ist eine Hecke. Das müssen wir jetzt alles rausrech rausrechnen und dann kriegt er entsprechend weniger Prämie. Das konnte ja dann durch massive Interventionen gestoppt werden. Aber demnächst möchte ich, dass genau wenn da Bäume stehen, wenn da Hecken sind, dass der Landwirt mehr kriegt und nicht weniger kriegt in dem Fördersystem. Und das wäre sozusagen eine Belohnung für die, die diese Agrarsysteme machen oder schon immer gemacht haben. Und wir holen so ein System aus der Nische. Ich kann sagen, man kommt ja als, jedenfalls früher war das so, als Europaabgeordneter auch ein bisschen durch die Gegend. Ich war mehrmals in Südamerika und habe auf der einen Seite die absolut industrielle Agrarindustrie gesehen mit, ja, alle kennen diese Bilder mit 20 Mähdreschern nebeneinander in einem endlos großen Feld. Ich habe dann aber auch die Kontraste angeschaut, wie indigene Gemeinschaften oder tatsächlich mitten in der, in der argentinischen Pampa ein Demeterbetrieb Agroforstsysteme gemacht hat in einer traditionellen Art und Weise. Wenn man dann die Erträge vergleicht, auch das gehört zur Wahrheit, dann ernten die Sojabauern zwei Tonnen Soja pro Hektar. Und während man in solchen nachhaltigen Systemen in diesen Agrarlandschaften ein Drei-, Vierfaches von dem erntet, weil man Stockwerkanbau betreibt und die Systeme sozusagen viel intensiver, aber auch besser genutzt werden. Auch das muss man, glaube ich, auch vielen, die immer noch von der industriellen Landwirtschaft schwärmen, erklären. Und ich hoffe, deshalb können wir neue Akzente setzen an dem Punkt und ich hoffe gerade, wie gesagt, von euch aus Griechenland, aber auch von anderen Ländern, dass diese Impulse auch in andere Länder getragen werden, dass man sagt, so sieht vielleicht eine nachhaltige Landwirtschaft in Zukunft aus und nicht mehr die großen industriellen Felder, wie wir es im Moment haben. Vielen Dank und äh, wenn Fragen sind, ich stehe ja gerne zur Verfügung. Okay, thank you very much. This was a really exciting talk, uh, hearing from the German point of view and seeing this nice picture that uh, it makes sense because uh, several times uh, agroforestry issues are uh, agroforestry issues are when we talk about them we think that uh, this has to do with uh, tropical countries and we are really pleased to uh, that we are uh, let's say have been understandable that this is a future for agriculture in uh, the the intensivity Uh, managed landscape. 
So I will uh, give the speech to our uh, next speaker, Matthias Sikhofen, who is a, a conservationist, a book author and photographer. And he's very well known for his actions in the Carpathians, preserving the Asian forest uh, there, uh, the need of uh, preserving this unique ecosystem. And uh, he will speak about the integration of strict nature protection and small scale agriculture in the Carpathians. So, Matthias, go on. Thank you very much. So, always the same problem. I was muted. So, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be able to speak here. I need to share my screen right now. I hope it works. Can you see it? Yes. Are you seeing the right screen or the um, notice board? Okay. So, yes, I would be speaking about biodiversity rich landscapes and I would try to bridge the issue we had at the, at the last event, the Capacians and the, and the old growth and primary forests, uh, also with the discussion about agroforestry and peasant lands. Uh, because there is the bridge and there are possibilities to actually combine that. Um, I will start a little bit with the context. Um, biodiversity rich ecosystems are rare in Europe and they are vanishing. They are vanishing due to intensification, they are vanishing due to greed, to illegal exploitation. Uh, that's, that's a widespread problem in some, uh, in some countries. Um, and uh, they are also vanishing because uh, the protection systems do not work properly. And uh, I will give you some examples um, a bit later. The biodiversity richness of landscapes correlates with the absence or the low degree of industrial exploitation of resources. So wherever you have industrialized uh, hardcore um, forestry or agriculture, biodiversity is more or less gone. Uh, here on the picture, you can see an example of a very beautiful peasant landscape in Northern Austria. Uh, it's an exceptional landscape, nobody knows, almost nobody yes. knows. Nur ganz kurz, ist die Referentenansicht. Aha, okay, that's what I, what I was afraid of. So sorry, I need to stop that. Okay. So, second try. So is this the right screen now? Yes. Yes, okay. Sorry for the confusion. I have two screens and this is always causing problems. <laughs> okay, so what you can see here is a, is a very biodiversity rich, beautiful cultural landscape in Northern Austria. Uh, it was constructed by, by the peasants four or 500 years ago. And it's, uh, it's now a landscape full of terraces and uh, stripes uh, and there's lots of bushes and trees which means that there's a lot of habitats for all kinds of different species you will not find anymore in a in a industrialized agriculture landscape uh, so this landscape is of course also worth to be um, protected and preserved uh -huh. and now Okay, it's still tricking me. Yes, and another important aspect of the context is that uh, we are running into uh, a climate crisis. Um, and uh, as you can see in this picture here, that uh, parts of the forests, uh, which have been planted in the last 100, 200 years, mainly coniferous monocultures, spruce monocultures are collapsing because of the effects of climate of the climate crisis. It's kind of a combination of the failures of uh, forestry and the emerging climate crisis. It makes management mistakes visible and leads to an increasing collapse of unexpectations. This is on the one hand bad for economy and it's bad for ecosystem services because the forest cover is just vanishing. On the other side, um, 
uh, the removal of the monocultures, and if this land would be left over for natural regeneration, this also would create a high degree of biodiversity. In this picture, you can see uh, how this is looking like. Uh, on the right side, you can see a natural forest, uh, which, which is part of a forestry management of a monastery in Austria. And this forest here is not exploited, it's a, it's a reserve. And on the other side of the valley, on the left hand side, you can see the monocultures which are getting more and more brown and which are collapsing. So the, all these spruce and pine trees will be gone in a few years, most likely. Um, this does not necessarily lead to learning effects, as we can see here. Um, so it's still, um, yeah, forestry is looking like agriculture here. Um, there's another problem, which is also important for the context, is that there's a raising demand for woody energy biomass. Uh, this is on the rise also because of subsidies. Uh, it's heavily subsidized in many countries. Uh, biomass, wood biomass is considered to be climate neutral and kind of zero emission. It's used green wash coal power plants in UK, in Denmark, and so on. And this leads to an increased stress, logging stress, also for nature forests. And but it's important to stress that the cutting and burning of major forests is not climate neutral before 2050. So the uh, CO2 will not be absorbed back. What you can see here is, uh, this is in my home country here, it's a Natura 2000 site where a old growth forest was cut just a few weeks ago. You can see this is very old trees, they have no value and they will just be burnt. So now I come to actually the example I would like to present you today. So considering all this context, uh, we still have some, land, some landscapes in Europe, which are um, highly interesting because of their biodiversity and also because of their tradition. Uh, and uh, many of these, of these uh, very valuable precious landscapes are located in the Carpathians, in particular in Romania. Uh, and we have there a mosaic of biodiversity rich natural forests, partly even primary in close vicinity also to settlements and to traditional villages um, and to small scale peasant lands. Um, and this kind of mosaic, uh, it's, uh, um, it's not, uh, it, it, it's, it's a perfect example of how an integration of human use of resources but also protection of biodiversity and ecosystem services could be looking like. This is just an overview about Romania. Uh, it shows locations of uh, potential old growth and primary forests. Uh, so you can see there is a lot left. Uh, it's, it's, estimations are about half a million hectare forests, which, which are really very biodiversity rich and have a high ecological value. And here you can see that these forests are uh, how they're ending up uh, all these very old trees with little economic value are being burned or shredded for cheap boards. Um, and, but this is a problem we have in whole Europe, that the logging intensity is increasing in Scandinavia and in the Carpathians. And uh, in, in the case of Romania, this led to a EU infringement procedure, uh, which was launched last year in February, um, but it got stuck somehow. And I will just talk about that a little later because this is part of the problem. So this coming back to Romania, uh, I would like to show you an example of Cern Valley. That's a beautiful valley in, this, in the heart of the Domoglet Valley of Cernay National Park, which is also a um, UNESCO World Heritage Site. On the picture, you can see the, the little hamlet of Prisagina. Um, and uh, in this, in this landscape, you have a very interesting mosaic of uh, low intensity agriculture, small scale agriculture, but on the other side also you can see up on this, uh, on this uh, mountains and hills that you can see there's a very natural forest, it's partly even a primary forest. And this shows how strict protection of natural ecosystems um, and also low impact economic use could be integrated. This doesn't have to be contradictions. Um, here in the picture, it's Boijuara. That's a little village in uh, Fagaraj Mountains in uh, southern Romania. There are almost only a few elderly people left. All the young people have left for the big cities. So the depopulation and the aging of the, of the rural uh, settlements is also a big problem. And logging is often seen as the only economical option because there is money coming from the logging companies, from the 
uh, sawmills, but the alternatives are not really developed. Um, yeah, this is how the logging logic is looking like. It does not create sustainable jobs. It destroys biodiversity and also critical ecosystem functions, especially in the mountains. And also it liquidates the foundations, uh, the potential foundations for tourism development, which would have a less uh, severe impact on the landscape. So back in Cherna Valley, uh, these ancient rural landscapes are a mix of culturally natural landscapes and they are of exceptional beauty. So all people who have seen this valley there, uh, they come back with, with shiny eyes and, uh, and, uh, and swear that they will go back one day. So this is a great opportunity to develop also low impact uh, rural and natural tourism. This would also generate income and improve the standard of living in these local communities. The people there live mainly on subsistence basis, but they have almost no income and in terms of, I don't know, diseases or sickness, this is really creating problems. So um, income from tourism would be very much appreciated and needed. Um, the examples here, there are some, some little hamlets in Chena Valley, uh, and they are part also of the National Park. They are part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh -huh. Google made an interesting <laughs> translation of heritage. It's not a geometric um, So this, these hamlets are located in the buffer zone and there has been a conflict between forest exploitation, which was actually emphasized by the Romanian state forest, but also by the National Park Administration. They wanted to open these valleys for logging green roads. Uh, and, but also on the other side, um, uh, the, the conservation objectives of the protected area. You can see here the area of Prisagina where this conflict uh, occurred a few years ago, Rob Silver wanted to build roads and exploit uh, the natural forests in this part of the national parks. Fortunately, there have been protests. There was a petition uh, which was signed by many thousands of people and this plan was stopped. So there is the opportunity now to actually tr try to develop a plan B to the logging logic uh, and to uh, develop this kind of natural tourism, which would be the alternative uh, for timber exploitation and which could also help to develop these um, economies there. Yeah, you can see uh, it's really of, of, uh, of great beauty. You have a kind of a mosaic of this uh, traditional peasant forest. So there was kind of low level timber extraction, single tree extraction, uh, whatever needed the firewood or construction wood uh, in the villages, but this was not industrial logging. There was never any, any larger clear cut. Uh, and nested in between, you still find also old growth and even primary forests there. And uh, if this would be opened just with hiking trails for hiking tourism, um, this would be compatible also with the conservation objectives of the protected area. So there would not be any contradiction and there would be an economic benefit. So this would be actually a win-win strategy. I just wonder why it it hasn't been done already. Yeah, there is there, there is almost no um, development into that direction, um, and uh, this would also help actually to create seasonal jobs and to hopefully bring back the young people, which 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 are hardly missing because uh, this this uh, villages are getting more and more empty. So as as a conclusion, both the natural ecosystems and the traditional smallholder agricultural landscapes need to be preserved. And we need to exploit all the legal means and uh, also uh, economic incentives, subsidies, whatever, to make that happen. This needs to be one, one um, important part also of the biodiversity strategy and of the official programs of the European Union. So therefore, coming back to my main work, um, I'm working with Euronatur on the protection of the old growth and primary forests in Romania, uh, the infringement procedure in Romania must go on. Romania is not on the right track now, and this will be a test case whether the biodiversity strategy uh, has a chance to be implemented or uh, whether it will fail. Because if, if in this stronghold of nature in Romania, uh, implementation of the biodiversity strategy uh, will, will not happen, then it will also fail in, in the rest of Europe. Yeah? So the, the European Commission must not allow the infringement procedure to be concluded just based on some minor legal adjustments, because that's 
what Romania is is proposing currently. Yeah, they want to comply, uh, increase the compliance with the nature directives uh, and the environmental impact, um, strategic environmental impact directive, uh, and so on. But at the moment, there's no plan to do any intervention with the current logging plans. So with the with the actual forest management plans which are in place. So if this would not be stopped, logging would go on for another 10 years in many locations and Europe would just stand by and watch how these forests are disappearing. So this must not happen. So therefore, uh, we very much hope that uh, the commission will do the next step and also bring this case to the Court of Justice of the European Union. Yeah, that's the value of Boyamika. We managed to get it under protection, 1000 hectare of virgin forest and uh, local communities a little bit downstream in the lower parts of the valley and they would um, benefit greatly from careful cautious nature tourism development so and this is probably one of the pilot projects which could be developed in the next years thank you so, uh, okay yeah. thank you very much and uh, i really appreciate these nice fantastic pictures of yours which remind us of course some uh, uh, similar landscapes of course in the northern part of greece which face exactly the similar problems of land abandonment that lead the local uh, local people already uh, uh, depopulated areas but uh, mainly the remains the, the the people that remain there are very old and they do not have any other income and they go to 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 log all this ancient uh, forest or yeah, yeah, yeah. this is a huge problem uh, i think and uh, all over balkans but i'm very happy and very pleased to see corners of our common land let's say europe uh, to being preserved uh, although uh, outside of the main economic uh, um, lay, let's say highway so it's really important to see the preservation of these ancient landscapes both within forest but also in agriculture agroforest landscape so i will uh, give the speech to Michalis Vrachnakis, who is a professor of the department of forest and wood science and design in the university of thessaly karditsa greece and he will uh, speak about this agroforest mediterranean landscapes and the need to revitalize these traditional silvo arab landscapes uh, in order to be beneficial for the local economy but also for the biodiversity and all these issues that we raise already so michalis uh, you can go on thank you very much for being mm -hmm. with us okay thank you guys uh, good evening everybody I uh, would like to thank also, apart from Rigas, for introducing me. I would like also to thank Klaus for organizing the webinar and uh, Jeff and Freda for supporting me. Uh, I will share my screen now. Yes. Well, as um, Rigas told, uh, uh, told before, I will present you the traditional civilable landscapes in the Mediterranean, and I will focus on the need to revitalize them. I hope at the end of the day that the Mediterranean tra uh, traditional agroforestry systems, uh, will you, it, it will be evident that they serve as values from the past and models for the future. This is an expectation for me, for my part. Well, uh, agroforestry, is a rural activity that refers to sustainable land management systems where the tree species are associated with herbaceous plants with some form of spatial arrangement uh, or time sequence. Uh, these systems can also be grazed by farm animals and this, uh, in this respect, we can distinguish three uh, such systems, the silvopastoral, agro-silvopastoral and silvo-arable systems. But what about traditional agroforestry systems? These systems created by man in the past and are preserved to this day. Their creation is linked to the achievement of economic, environmental, and social goals. According to Professor Papanastasis, they have high cultural value that reflects the ways in which man lived in the past close to nature, faced and exploited the available natural resources, 
interacted with the environment and incorporated the natural elements and mostly the trees into his her life. Uh, uh, Martin talked before about the environmental benefits that we can acquire from, uh, from agroforestry systems. So environmental benefits are mostly modification of the microclimate. It is positively affecting the population and diversity of insects and adjustment of water and nutrients in a general uh, framework. Uh, economic benefits are also uh, quite important that we uh, acquire from traditional agroforestry systems like timber, firewood, charcoal, piles, and not wood forest products. Uh, when we uh, incorporate it in our systems, fruit, fruit or truffle bearing trees. But the most important, maybe the most important is the social benefits that we uh, get from the traditional agroforestry systems. Such uh, benefits, such social benefits are referred to social cohesion and connectivity. Uh, they support a variety of rural development resources, urge farmers to make sustainable land use practices, ensuring of human health infrastructure, alternative food supply, and mitigation of adverse effect on the environment, improve job creation opportunities, improve also public opinion on agricultural and forestry activities, create healthy environments, improve the landscape, while preserving the, tra the traditional agroforestry systems, the cultural value of a rural landscape is enhanced. Uh, agroforestry is a rural activity that came from the prehistoric times. The early stages of agricultural activity in Europe included the interplay of agricultural and forestry exploitation. The end of the Neolithic period and the beginning of the Bronze Age, the forests in Europe were open, like savanna type. We can see some representations on the right. Later, when the woodcuts were stabilized, some trees were preserved in or, in, or others were planted for fruit production, etc. Traditional agroforest, uh, agroforestry systems were present in all uh, historic times. Here's a representation of the landscape of the surroundings of ancient Olympia, and you can see it in Greece and in all Greece, in ancient Greece, and we can see here the integration of uh, trees inside the landscape. Also in Roman, in Roman times, we can uh, uh, see the landscape, how it was uh, represented in this uh, picture. Uh, it is the case of Liguria in Italy. In Byzantine times, uh, traditional agroforestry systems were active in, during Byzantine times. In uh, Renaissance, here is a landscape that still exists in, the, uh, in Tuscany where you can see elements of this of the traditional agroforestry systems. And now we are coming to nowadays, uh, talk about the traditional agroforestry systems. Uh, I will show you some examples from, from the Mediterranean countries, uh, some traditional such systems, like for example, in France, there are the Prévarsé, uh, the grazing orchards, but um, in the south of France, they, are, they can also include crops, olive trees and uh, walnut trees. Also in this uh, uh, agroforestry system, it is very famous also for ecotouristic activities. In Spain, there is a peculiar type of uh, agroforestry system that is traditional, it is called Pomarada, and it was found in Asturias. Uh, uh, here in the upper story, we, we can find apples, pears, plums, cherries, figs, walnuts, and the ground, and the ground crop it could be cereals, corn, sorghum, and several other crops. In Spain and Portugal, of course, it is, it is well known, Desas and Mondados, that they are very uh, famous in all over the world about their peculiarities, about the uh, product, the production and the support they provide to the rural economies of this country. And uh, here you see where is, uh, these uh, systems are located in the Iberian Peninsula. It is mostly found on the south uh, of this peninsula. Also in Spain and Portugal, in the Hesas and Mondados, uh, we can say something about the uh, silvopastoral systems that uh, integrate Cuerco Sube, that produce cork, which is very uh, important for um, uh, as a uh, product that sustains the rural economy of Portugal, mostly of Portugal, but also in Spain. 
In Italy, we can say something about semina pivo or pascolo arborato, the seed of soak, uh, several pastoral systems, uh, occasion, uh, occasion, occasionally combined with crops. In Italy, there are these fantastic systems that are traditional and still active. It called, they are called piantata and juale. Piantata, actually, they are fruit orchards, survivable systems that incorporated with vineyards and poplars. Uh, piantata is called in northern Italy and olives, uh, juale, which is called in southern Italy. It's common. In Greece, um, the traditional agroforestry systems are quite often uh, represented in uh, these fantastic paintings of 19th century that show us the increased, the, the high cultural values uh, uh, for nowadays, but also they represent that uh, these systems were parts of the rural landscape of countryside of that times. Yeah, in Greece, we can, uh, now that it is uh, active, uh, the most important, most famous, it is the Valonia Oak civil pastoral system that uh, uh, Anastasia will present you more later in her presentation. Uh, we have some peculiar other, other systems like polarted morris trees for silkworms. Here you see also women working uh, to, for producing silk, mostly in the northeast of Greece. Uh, olive orchards, Nanfisa and Rovies and Epidavros, they, uh, they are often combined um, livestock grazing in the story. Also, um, in Lesbos Island, you can find um, olives on uh, terraces and also some, um, some uh, peculiar systems that they integrate geese in the, in the understory or even chicken. Uh, resin collection from pines, pine um, uh, pastoral systems, you can find Aleppo pine, mostly Aleppo pine, you can find in several places of, of Greece, but still active. Uh, also, honey pines that produce uh, famous honey from, uh, from pines it is another such system. Now, uh, after this journey to, uh, to some examples of uh, traditional agroforestry systems, let's focus on the issues of degradation of the Mediterranean uh, systems. Uh, according to my, to my opinion, there are three major uh, drivers that um, lead to the uh, increase the extinction risk of this system. The first is the land abandonment. Land abandonment, there is a, there is a projection of abandonment land in Mediterranean countries by two, uh, 2030 that says that uh, in, in, the Euro in the European Union, it is expected that up to 2030, more than 5.6 million thousands of hectares will be abandoned. A significant part of this uh, is part of the Mediterranean countries, as you see here in this, uh, in this uh, table. Uh, look at this uh, picture from, uh, uh, from the Google Earth. It is a village here in Greece. It is in the center of Greece. It's called Batsunia. It is found in elevation of 480 meters, and the population is 450 inhabitants. And here you see the wrinkled landscape, which is formed in the surroundings of the village. These wrinkles are made uh, the hedgerows. And here you see the hedgerows, uh, the abandonment effect on the hedgerows. Uh, also here, uh, it is the same village and you see how this, the, this uh, geometrical, let's say, uh, openings are starting to close gradually because of the abandonment. And here is the, in an upper uh, level, you can see uh, such uh, rainbow landscapes that gradually has lost its breakdown for formation and it, it, the landscape is becoming more homogenized. homogenized. Another force for, um, uh, for um, increasing the extinction risk of the traditional agroforestry systems is land reparceling and conversion into monocultures. Here is an example of the uh, of a remnant of uh, it is a remaining uh, of um, a, a bigger civil uh, pastoral systems system that it was that it is still active in Kedros in Karvitsa and this village, and you can see how is the surrounding the, uh, the the conversion of this type of uh, agroforestry 
into monocultures. It is pity that, uh, uh, that this landscape uh, has this kind of form, which is not so, uh, according to my opinion, which is not so environmentally healthy. Also, another uh, another um, uh, reason for increasing the extinction risk is the legal wood cutting of all trees. Here is an example, a sad example, from uh, uh, Lesos Island in Greece, that uh, these uh, trees were chopped to provide uh, firewood uh, during the economic crisis for the local people. So uh, let's speak a little about modern agroforestry and the CAP and how rural development programs included agroforestry measure in Mediterranean countries. Portugal, Spain, and France were included this measure and uh, activate this measure and implement this measure from, uh, uh, from the uh, very beginning of the, uh, of, the appearance, of the appearance of agroforestry in the CAP. In Italy, the first period was not uh, implemented implemented because um, uh, there was not so the farmers were not so aware about this measure but then the rest periods they uh, implement the measure the agroforestry measure but in Greece no unfortunately no my country never applied this measure it's a pity but never uh, in the first period in the period of 2007-2013 the money the founding for the, the implementation of the measure were moved, channelized to uh, to deal with the uh, catastrophic uh, um, effects that we have uh, due to wildfires in Greece. And the next period, it was uh, economic crisis, and the money, and the funding were moved to another uh, to, an, to other measures. But this is about modern agroforestry, but no inclusion of tasks. It means that uh, even the agroforestry measure that still exists and support modern agroforestry, this measure unfortunately still does not support the inclusion, that does not support uh, the traditional agroforestry systems in Europe. Uh, to cope with degradation of uh, traditional agroforestry systems, there are some possible so solutions according to my perception. First of all, is to make an, an uh, intensive inventory program to invent all the traditional agroforestry systems that they are, they are uh, all in Europe, not only Mediterranean, but also in Europe. Um, another uh, possible solution is to include uh, traditional agroforestry systems into CAP eco schemes. Also CAP must, uh, must provide, must, must provide uh, traditional agroforestry systems related provisions and this provision must be translated into member, member states rural development programs um, cap must also must focus mostly according to my perception must move its central focus to include also land abandonment uh, issues um, another solution could be the land abandonment management plans which is according to my opinion is very important uh, to trace and find the, the problems of uh, abandonment and to deal with them in a, in a very comprehensive way. I have here, I'm writing here also three billion question marks because we, as Mark said before, and we all know, and all of us, we are aware that three billion trees will be planted in Europe, but where? This is the problem where these uh, trees will be planted and maybe some of them could be plant in traditional agroforestry systems to revitalize them. And finally, promotion of special traditional agroforest products in the market, which is uh, uh, another important solution that uh, will uh, uh, support uh, traditional agroforestry in, uh, in our countries. And some mild derivations of low cost are additionally proposed like regular pruning of trees, thinning of trees, planting extra trees, and educational promotion of agroforestry and especially traditional agroforestry systems in the social structures. Thank you very much. And this is the, the link for uh, URAF. URAF is the European Agroforestry Federation and, and there someone can find a very important information about uh, agroforestry nowadays 
and traditional also at the forest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michalis, for the very interesting and great uh, presentation. Uh, you travel all across uh, the, so many countries, showing us so many examples. But also, I have to point out that uh, you press also the cultural button and the importance of the cultural landscapes, which is uh, several times ignored. So thank you very much again for the three billion question marks you placed. <laughs> and uh, um, I want to, uh, to say that uh, because Matthias uh, Sikhofen has to leave at uh, 7.30, uh, would be... Uh, could you please, uh, Matthias, ask uh, uh, answer in a, a question that has been made to you, especially before leaving, uh, that has to do with um, agroforestry systems and how, uh, what else can be done except of uh, of the uh, of the the tourism, or if this uh, the tourism is the only the only proposal that we have to, rev to revitalize these uh, unique uh, abandoned landscapes. Okay. Uh, my video is switched off. Could you please switch it on? Ah, okay. Now I'm back. Okay. I sent the written answer already. Of course, uh, of course, tourism is not the only option to um, improve the situation in these uh, peripheric regions. Uh, of course, there's also the option to uh, develop direct marketing, whatever um, options of agricultural products, specialties, handicraft stuff. Um, there, there are lots of initiatives all over Europe which could serve also as models. I come from an area where organic farming has been started by a small number of farmers in the north of Austria. And now in this region, um, a quite significant proportion of farmers are organic farmers and they also produce specialties. They can uh, sell for a better price in the region, but also in special shops in the, in the urban areas. Uh, and this, it, this also helps to, to um, get more economic development and welfare also in these in this peripheries. Yeah? So I think there are there are much more options, and there are lots of there's lots of literature around how to develop um, rural areas. Um, the I think the tourism is especially interesting when it comes to areas which are of great natural beauty or where the natural values are very high, like areas in the Capetians where you have uh, primary no growth forests, which could be uh, in particular interesting for tourists and for hikers, which is not the case in all the agri agriculture landscapes in Europe. I hope this was somehow sufficient. And then there was the question about um, um, measures and um, subsidies and so on. Maybe Martin, maybe you can say something about that. I think I think leader and similar problems also provide funds for especially this this, this kind of, of projects. I think it's okay now. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, Martin wants to make a small point now or after uh, Mrs. Pande uh, Anastasia Bandera, who will speak about uh, uh, who is the next speaker. And uh, she is a professor of the Department of Forestry and Natural Environment in, uh, of the Agricultural University of Athens. And she will speak about silvopastoral uh, activities and especially uh, about uh, uh, this system in the time, uh, some examples and the work of the science community on them. So uh, it's up to you. If, uh, do you, if uh, Martin wants to make a small point now, it's open, but uh, I would prefer to have uh, everything all together in the end of the first round. Okay, Martin. Okay, so uh, I give then the floor to uh, Anastasia Bandera. Thank you very much for being with us. 
and we are opening our eyes and our ears to hear about your uh, interesting presentation. Thank you very much, Rigas. It is great to be here. Um, let me start my presentation. It starts from the end. Okay, sorry. So it is really great to be here and share my thoughts and my results with you. And of course, my uh, concerns mostly. And uh, so it's really great to be among people that they really think or care about uh, agroforestry and especially in the pastoral systems. So anyway, um, as I said, I'm going to try, I try to be as confined as possible, especially in the, um, especially in the, um, in, in the silvopastoral systems. Uh, so I would be more than happy. Can, can you see my presentation? Is everything okay yes. now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just okay. uh, stop the because uh, before it runs all the only one ones. So <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to I'm going to try to be short, but not that short. Okay. Thank you very so, much. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, I'm pretty sure that you have heard so many times about the definitions about the group forestry. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time just to point out the key words. I, for me, it's quite important to stay on the key words. So here are a couple of quite popular definitions of agroforestry. So what I would like you to focus well is on the, uh, the words in red. So what is agroforestry? It's land use, trees, crops, livestock, same area, spatial or temporal arrangements. Uh, in Ag Forward, in the project that I have been working, I was happy to be a part of Ag Forward. So we also have more or less concluded to a definition, wood vegetation, crop, livestock, ecological, economic interactions. Again, keywords. So another definition, which actually lately I'm starting, I'm hearing a lot about, you know, the concerns about the farm to fork and all the EU policies. And the bottom line is what we're looking for is we're looking to maximum output to minimum um, entrance. So I think agroforestry is the answer to that. Agroforestry is the land use practice that is actually more or less by default is trying to uh, take full advantage of the natural resources, respecting the natural resources and try actually to take the mostly out of it. So how old is it? Um, it is very old. And I'm talking about silvopastoral systems, of course. So based on Leoru, uh, it is, has been very, very old, especially in the Mediterranean region. And I'm, 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 I'm going to play some emphasis, some emphasis, not all my emphasis to the Mediterranean regions, uh, because it is a specific part of the world that, as you know, as everybody knows, has been not so much affected by the ice age. So it has been a, a very traditional, a very old practice. And uh, so in time has been really um, included livestock in the, in the natural environment. It has, has been incorporated within the, the system. And uh, as Michalis Brachnakis showed, uh, there are there are the depicts there are paintings that actually present livestock silvopastoral systems in time and especially in Roman, but also if you read the, the Odyssey uh, from Omer, you can also read the description of some traditional agroforest and silvopastoral systems. So it is quite old. How old? That old through dinosaurs. Take into account that actually silvopastoral systems are a system that actually livestock graze in the, in the, in the forest. Um, so maybe we can say that, but well, no, it, this was just to uh, just uh, a funny picture, uh, picture that I thought it would be really lighten up the, the, my presentation because what is missing from this point is the human component. So yeah, agroforestry systems are all are traditional systems. And uh, of course, it's, it's, it's an excellent combination of humans, natural resources, and livestock. 
um, there are throughout, uh, I think that the Mediterranean is, is an excellent example. It's, it's, it's an agroforestry system by, by, by default. So here you can see um, a, a very typical example of an agroforestry system, which is uh, the oasis. It, this is a picture from Tunisia. And actually, uh, usually people there, after the end of the, gra of the grazing of the uh, cropping system, they usually use on the, on the other ground, they use henna. And uh, so at the end of the cropping system, they introduce their livestock to clear up the land. So this is an excellent example. I, I have a great admiration of these people that they take a full advantage of uh, the natural resources, of course, respecting the natural resources. Here you can see also uh, many examples from uh, that we have uh, studied in the Act Forward project. And um, so this picture here, now, can you see also my, the, my while I move the mouse, uh, Rigas? Is it possible? Okay. So here you can see a picture from Spain, which is actually from Galicia. And uh, there you ha we, they have this uh, chestnut uh, forest. And uh, here are the, the famous uh, black Iberian pig grays. So, and uh, okay, so the, the, there is a market for these chestnuts, but the point is that at the end, uh, in or in areas that they're not available for people to go and collect the chestnuts uh, usually the, the this is these are the ones that they have been used for the for the pig grazing and another another uh, another typical example of uh, livestock grazing is uh, here down here which is from Italy and uh, it is actually the, these are some um, olive groves and uh, which, which based on the results we had from the Gap Forward project, it was perfectly actually uh, being used afterwards by chicken. So, and uh, here's another example from France. I'm gonna show you this example again. So anyway, the point is that we have some very, very nice examples from uh, the use of uh, silopastoral systems. So anyway, what are the silopastoral systems uh, by definition? Uh, based on the more recent classification by Maria Rosa Mosquera, uh, and that will have been widely adopted, actually, not but by, by P.K. Nair and not other uh, um, uh, researchers working on agroforestry. So we have these uh, more or less major types of agroforestry. The, the two most popular ones are the silvo arable the ones that also Vrachnakis Michalis has presented and other uh, uh, researchers, and silvopasture. So what is silvopasture? It's com the combination of trees with forage and animal production. So um, it is in, in a forest or a woodland grazed or an upper forest trees. Of course, there are other type of classifications in agroforestry. I'm just showing this. And if someone wants to have more information, they can always read this, uh, the, the article from Michael Van Herden. So it was also from um, the Act Forward project. So more or less, silvopastoral systems are traditional agroforestry systems. And the, the key words that I have said before are the livestock that we, we actually, it's producing, it's giving um, a, 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 a wide actually number of uh, products and which is nicely integrated with trees and shrubs. So uh, it is actually, a com it, it's not so easy. Some might say, okay, so if this is the pastoral systems, I can always go and create one or make one. Uh, and this is actually one of the criticism that uh, there is on silvopastoralism. I'm going to talk about a little bit further on that because uh, people say that, oh no, uh, as Martin has said, in, uh, there's a dif difference between Northern Euro Europe and Southern Europe. Okay, so silvopastoralism is, is actually defined by a combination of the species, of the climate, of the system and the ownership. So it's not just one and one makes two. As I tell my students, uh, when we are we are more or less biological science. So in, in this science, one and one does not always equal to two. 
in, sometimes equals to zero and sometimes equals to 10. So actually, you, when you design and someone wants to design a simple particle system, they have, he ha, or she has to take into account a lot of uh, factors. And um, so the silver pastoral systems are, are very generous in providing a lot of products. And uh, like timber, fuel, wood, um, anything that you can name, all the goods that actually trees provide. They have a lot of function and this is what makes them so important because they have a lot of uh, functions that they're very important, especially lately due to the climate change like water economy, like nitrogen, like inputs that I have said at the beginning, like shading and wind breaks, which is quite also important, especially because of the climate change. And of course, erosion control and not mentioning also the boundary markets. And the animals, they, they, they are so important it's for pastoral systems because they provide all these goods, like whatever we, we it's quite obvious, like, dairy products, milk and cheese and everything, but they also do many, many other good things. What? They actually uh, enhance uh, organic matter turnover and nutrient transfer. They remove the sprouts. They actually increase soil organic matter. And I think that's what's quite really important lately is that they reduce the understory biomass and subsequently reduce forest fire risk. Actually, we have done a work uh, last year and it was quite interesting because we have used GIS and other uh, interesting modern tools. And we have more or less seen that in agroforestry systems, we have less forest fire incidents. So this is a major issue, especially lately, lately because of the forest fires problems. Of course, it, nothing, as I said before, in, in biological sciences, like, like in agroforestry, in forestry, in agro agriculture, of course, it, one and one does not always equals to two. So of course we have problems. And what's the problem? The problem is that the, the animals may damage the, the regeneration and the trees. But this is what this management for. It's not like we're just going to introduce the, 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 the animal, the livestock, and then go. Of course, everything needs to be attended. And of course, in the management need, needs to be done. So uh, for example, in Greece, we have uh, several silvopastoral systems. These are divided to the open forest. These are traditional ones with canopy less than 40% and grazable forest that tree canopy is more than 40%. And again, this one plus one does not equal two example because some people say, and some colleagues also say that, okay, are you suggesting that we graze the forest? Okay, if, if we can, yes, of course, if we can, not if we cannot. For example, after a regenerating, uh, after a regeneration or any other type of uh, treatment or, or the area, or the soil is, is eroded or is, uh, is, is actually uh, is prone to erosion, then no, we cannot graze there. We can only graze when it's, when, where we can and when we can. And this is again, this is what the management is for. So in Greece and also not only Greece in Mediterranean actually area, we have some different husbandry types. We have the village or the flock system. So we have the move, the movement of animals from the upper uh, altitude to the lower altitude. And actually this, this was so nice and, and, and it was enhancing so much the, the biodiversity and everything. And uh, it, it's, it, these are the husbandry times that they're getting less and less interest lately. And I think this is something that really needs to be preserved. So, um, and take into account that, that uh, Mediterranean is also uh, the meeting point of three different continents. And that means that you have all these different species. So this luxury, this, 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 this great uh, biodiversity, and a uh, great uh, uh, presence of different species that really needs to be preserved. So uh, silvopastoral systems, as I said, give a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, advantages. Uh, and I think that these are actually the advantages that they have so much more uh, importance lately because of this climate change.
So you use a lot of space, you protect the biodiversity, uh, you enhance soil properties, you increase, of course, production because the, the stakeholder, the farmer can have more income out of his land. And as I said, the, the what's really important, lower forest fire risks. Of course, as I said, we have some disadvantages, but as I also said, this is what is management for. In management, you have to take into account these problems and deal with them. So lately, the agroforestry systems are facing some problems. What are the problems? The problems is most in most of the case, cases that uh, uh, they, they, people are not so much into uh, grazing. Young people are not so much into grazing. Uh, sometimes they feel embarrassed if to admit that they are uh, shepherds. And um, and they and, and they prefer to uh, to do some other type of jobs that they are more fancy and they hear better to the ear, like even uh, work on the tourist uh, uh, industry. And uh, so this is one of the major problem of of pastoral system. There, the the, the, the start, sorry. So also to climate change, we have a lot of problems. And um, so this is the land use changes. Sorry, but I was also in another meeting today <clears throat> and I was talking all day. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, one minute, please. Okay, take a minute break. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have to know, uh, there, there are some questions uh, in the Q&A chat room, but uh, uh, you can uh, add more, but please do it uh, um, directly to whom you want to be answered so that uh, I can easily uh, spread the message to each of the of the speakers and to combine uh, probably some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Anastasia, okay, yeah, is, is okay? Okay. Don't uh, you. press yourself. Uh, thank you very it much. It is the fourth presentation of the day, so. Okay, <laughs> we understand. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so anyway, and um, I was given the opportunity lately to uh, also look about the, uh, the the effect of the forest season to climate change in, in specific. So I think that um, um, agroforestry is, uh, is threatened lately in silvopastoral systems, of course, because of the land use changes. Actually, we have also done a work last year and we have uh, evaluated the land use changes in, a, in a silvopastoral systems in Greece. I'm gonna show some pictures afterwards. And it was really amazing that, I mean, it, 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 is, it is quite obvious because farmers prefer to abandon the silvopastoral systems and use their land for other more um, typical uh, um, syst um, systems like olive groves. So we have this ag agricultural abandonment, um, which is quite affecting all, spe mostly specifically the mountainous regions. And actually was surprised because I thought that this was a problem of Greece. But as I said, I took a glance on the literature and I discovered that this is a common problem, not only to Greece, but all, to most uh, Mediterranean uh, countries. Uh, for example, I was reading uh, an article from Morocco and they had the same problems there. I was discussing with some colleagues from Turkey and they said exactly the same problem. So it is a common problem. And I think, I, I hope that this is, will be also something um, to deal with from the policy makers. And I'm very happy that we have some today. So maybe I'm just, um, they're gonna get some ideas. So, and, and Martin, you, you, you mentioned a new terminology new normal. I love this terminology. I'm going to introduce another terminology of my own, knowledge flexibility, which means what? Who wants to listen to something new or uh, hear it? We have organized many stakeholder meetings and um, it was quite obvious that 
we were telling the same things to people and some were listening and some were not. So the adoption of the knowledge was quite different among people. So this knowledge flexibility, it's quite important because no matter what we say, no matter what we do, if people do not want to listen, then it's, it's for vain. So if we want to save the pastoral systems, if we want to save the agroforestry system, people have also to be ready to adopt this new uh, or, or old um, systems and knowledge. So, uh, for example, here is a picture from one of our experiments in, in the island of uh, Kea, Zia. it's in the Aegean. And uh, here, here you can see um, an abundant before silvopastoral, uh, silvopastoral systems. And uh, the farmer, the, the father of the farmer, he used to, uh, in the old time, he used to use this area to produce uh, 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 crop to feed his animals. So this, this hasn't been practiced for many years. So when we were then, when we talked about, uh, about and we gave them the idea of silvopastoral, silvopastoralism, and uh, he, he, two, two farmers were quite uh, interested on, on applying it. So you can see out of the 20 or 30 farmers, two were one, the ones that had the knowledge flexibility to hear, listen, they were very excited and actually they were very readily to adopt this new slash traditional practice. So as you can see here, he did it, he practiced it. He, these are the outcomes here. You can see these are Valonia oak, Vercus laburinsis of Swiss macrolepsis. And here is the crop that he's gonna to use to feed his animals, his livestock. And uh, here also you can see some pictures from uh, Greece and here also the problems actually, this is a picture of the problems. Here on the, on the top, you can see an ex silvopastoral system of Avalonia oak. And now the locals are actually cutting down the trees and they're converting into olive groves. Here, it's also another picture from the other side of the same of forest of this Valonia oak. And here you can see that on, on the main, on the, on the flat line, uh, the farmers prefer to cut the trees and make it to turn it to agricultural uh, intensive uh, culture. Another problem of the pastoral systems is actually, so, so you have to, we have to do two extremes. We have the abandonment and we have the overgrazing in some cases. In this case also here, you can see the abandonment. So here the, the, the farmers prefer to, they have left because it's not easily accept, accept, accessible because for some reason. So we have this understory vegetation, we have the foreign, uh, some, uh, in some cases, some other species invading. So more or less, we have problems of regeneration and we have been working for the past seven years in, the same, in this specific area and we are trying to, find the answer why there is such a low regeneration in the pastoral systems. Here is another picture of uh, the same forest and you can see some uh, goat grazing the, 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 the trees. Uh, I, some people say that we, they, they are not really so happy with uh, the goats. Well, no, I'm not. I'm, uh, th this, is, this is a part of the, of the landscape. Goats have been there, have been grazing. They have been forever. Uh, I wouldn't dare to say I take the goats out of there. What I would dare though to say is if somebody has concerns about the grazing, uh, goat grazing, then uh, they should actually apply management. So you cannot just leave the, the animals, the livestock and leave. You have to be there. You have to take care of, the, of the, the livestock and you have to lead the livestock. This is what shepherds are for. So, and uh, other problems of the silvopastoral systems is that you can see also here on the back, the silvo this is another silvopastoral system, the oak from Greece. And uh, they have cut down the trees and they have turned them to, to solar panel uh, uh, systems. Okay, so um, overgrazing in some cases, so loss of uh, soil abandonment on the top. Here's another beautiful picture of this great uh, silvopastoral system. It actually, I should say that is, it's one of the last unique silvopastoral systems in the Balkan. So this needs to be preserved. 
this is the picture actually also it's it's a very nice it's a very mediterranean and uh, traditional um, landscape and uh, i should mention at this point that this this uh, this this uh, forest was preserved the silvopastoral system was preserved because of the acorns you can see on the on the lower picture that it has been a great uh, trading in the past for the acorns and for the and, and for the uh, for the cups Lately, there has been some efforts to revive this traditional practice, but again, people are not so, as I said, flexible. They're not willing, there is no willingness to listen to these past slash new traditional systems. And uh, these are some other pictures from uh, Sino pastoral systems. And um, also, uh, I think that these are pictures of really the Mediterranean landscape. It's, it's not Greece, it could be Turkey, it could be Italy, it could be Morocco, it could be France, it could be uh, Spain. This is a Mediterranean silvopastoral system. So, uh, yeah, because we have, to, we have to realize that the livestock is is part of the system. It's part of the landscape. It's part of the tradition. It's part of our history. So just some uh, to show you some how much these silvopastoral systems are important. They are the, concerning our, our tradition and our natural environment. Actually, here are a few numbers that I have collected for us from uh, previous research. So you can see in the of, of the of the whole uh, agricultural area. Of the area you see in Greece, we have a, a lot, uh, uh, quite uh, a lot uh, area. Uh, the same with Cyprus, you have some uh, public owned forest. We have the vegetation with coriferous forest and everything. And uh, also from Turkey, you have also this oak forest from Turkey, uh, from Quercus. <clears throat> And Israel also, we have the same Quercus taborensis uh, forest, uh, the, the tabor oak, as they say. So anyway, the good news concerning the silvopastoral system is that there is a growing interest lately for uh, due to the environmental awareness. And uh, they have to be included in this deforestation and also research projects. They, they can provide many products, actually. They provide even black tur turfers, for example. I mean, there are so many reasons to protect this forest. That, 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 so we have to, to advertise these products if we want to save them. And uh, so we have to, as I said, I think it's quite important to get in contact with the local people. If you want to save something, if you want to preserve something, you have to make it in accordance, in collaboration and cooperation with the locals, the farmers. If they don't, if they, if they don't, if they don't want to be involved, then you, I think that you have a lost cause there. And of course, we have to make an evaluation, evaluation, economic, excuse me, evaluation of the ecosystem services. Uh, for ex so this is why I think I have placed in, 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 in my in, uh, presentation the, the importance of the educational projects. One project that we have uh, worked on was the Agroth MMM. It was an Eras Erasmus project. And I think through this project, we have, have been given the opportunity to come to get in contact with many farmers and present the systems. And I think that we did some good for this. Uh, for example, another one was uh, uh, another um, uh, relevant training based uh, activity was uh, in uh, Hungary. And uh, Another Erasmus project, which is called Climate Change, is running right now. You can find it also in YouTube. There have been quite a lot of presentations concerning uh, agroforestry and silvopastoral systems, of course. <clears throat> Anastasia, could yes? you please uh, sum up? Uh, yeah, yeah. You will yeah, have the please. opportunity yeah, yeah. to say more yeah. uh, during the yeah. Q&A yeah. uh, section. Thank you. Okay. And uh, yeah, of course. And actually, this is these are the examples. So here, the forward project you can find if somebody wants to have more information of the pastoral or agroforestry system is generous. In general, you can find a lot of uh, information. And uh, just to conclude, uh, I would like to point here. This is an experiment we had of the pastoral system. It was the same rationale. It was a pastoral systems in Northern Ireland. In or, excuse me, here is Northern Ireland in England. 
and in France. Same components, apple trees with sheep. Very successful in France, not successful at all in Northern Ireland. Meaning what? Management. You need the management. You have to take into account. You have to know. So if someone wants to have more information, we have the innovation leaflets that we have produced through like forward projects. So you can take a look at, uh, look at them. Also in the Affinite projects, a lot of uh, uh, leaflets and lots of information that anybody can use. Uh, as also Michali said, in, we have the European Agroforestry Federation where somebody would, who would like to have more information on agroforestry, he can uh, go to. So you, you can see we have many information there as well in Europe. And in Greece also we have the Hellenic Agroforestry Network. So there are many, many associations and many, many locations that people can actually go in for information. So to conclude, for me, sound management is really needed to support and preserve them as part of our natural environmental heritage. So thank you very much. And I hope I didn't take a lot of time, Rigas. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Anastasia. I have to give uh, right, uh, 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 there are we are uh, uh, very pleased to have uh, Martin uh, here and uh, I give him uh, f the, the floor because he has to live in eight minutes. So please, Martin, uh, you have also already three questions in the Q&A, so go on. <laughs> Ja, kann ich gerne machen. Ich muss leider auch um 8 Uhr in die nächste Veranstaltung. Ja, nur, nur ganz kurz zu dem, was gesagt wurde. Ich fand das wirklich alles sehr interessant. Und ich möchte noch mal, noch mal deutlich, es geht nicht nur sozusagen um Südeuropa. Wir haben auch in Mitteleuropa, auch in, in Deutschland, traditionelle Systeme gehabt, die in den letzten Jahren verschwunden sind. Zum Beispiel in Baden-Württemberg. Und auch bei uns, kleinbäuerliche Gegend, war um jedes Dorf eine riesen... Obstbaumplantage, alte Obstbäume äh, und auch in, zwischen den an Wegerändern waren immer Obstbäume gepflanzt. Die sind alle in den letzten Jahren verschwunden. Warum? Weil es keine Nutzung mehr gab. Ähm, bei uns in Hessen gibt es traditionell ein Getränk, was äh, schwer zu verköstigen ist, ähm, und zwar Apfelwein. <lacht> das trinken nur bestimmte harte Menschen. Äh, aber das, das konsumiert keiner mehr. Ja? Und deshalb haben diese Bäume keinen Wert mehr. Man, man äh, freut sich jetzt zwar noch, dass da Vögel drin sitzen, aber vor 20 Jahren hatte das keinen Wert mehr. Deshalb ist meine These, das gilt also auch für alle Regionen, wir müssen diese Landschaften, ich hoffe, ich bin jetzt noch zu hören, ja, äh, wir müssen diese Landschaften, ich bin, yes, we hear you, yes. Ja, okay. Very Diese Landschaften wieder, wieder in, in, Wert, in Wert setzen. Wir müssen sozusagen einen Nutzen wieder, wieder kreieren. Und das können wir mit verschiedenen Töpfen auch der Europäischen Union machen. Also ich habe vorhin viel über die erste Säule geredet, wo das jetzt möglich ist. Aber alle Mitgliedsländer und vor allem in Südeuropa haben die Mitgliedsländer eine zweite Säule, wo man genau solche Aktivitäten verknüpfen kann. Tourismus, Regionale Verkostung, regionale Vermarktung kann man zum Beispiel über Leader-Programme wunderbar mit anderen Akteuren sozusagen Projekte kreieren. Also es ist nicht immer nur der Bauer gefragt, sondern es ist die Region gefragt. Es ist auch, sind auch die gefragt, der, der Handel, die verarbeitenden Gewerbe, die müssen mit ins Boot geholt werden, damit man sozusagen nicht nur eine Landschaft hat, an der man sich erfreuen kann, sondern dass die Menschen, die da sind, auch wieder Nutzen davon haben. Ansonsten erleben wir auch in diesen Regionen, die Bilder waren ja eben klar, eine Intensivierung. Ich habe das selber auch in, in Portugal gesehen, da werden halt diese Regionen, da wird massiv Eukalyptus angepflanzt, weil man mit diesen Eukalyptusbäumen, äh, Portugal hat ja eine große, große Industrie, um Papierholz herzustellen, das wird halt dann mit Eukalyptus äh, aufgeforstet und wir alle wissen, was das für Folgen hatte bei den Bränden in den letzten Jahren. Äh, deshalb muss auch ein, ein Interesse da sein, diese alten Systeme zu erhalten, weil die auch in vielen Ländern einen ganz erheblichen Beitrag dazu geleistet haben, etwas gegen, gegen Feuer zu unternehmen. Brach liegen gelassene Regionen oder Regionen, wo man Eukalyptus pflanzt, diese Regionen gehen als erstes in Flammen auf, wenn wirklich was passiert und dann äh, kommen danach die Spekulanten. Deshalb müssen wir, deshalb müssen wir diese Regionen sozusagen über alle Förderprogramme 
mit reinnehmen. Und man muss diese Förderprogramme kombinieren. Wir haben jetzt für alle Mitgliedsländer einen riesen Recovery-Fonds. Es ist eure Aufgabe vor Ort sozusagen, dass eure Mitgliedsländer, das Griechenland, dass andere Länder sozusagen diese Recovery-Fonds jetzt nicht nur ausgeben für Technologien, sondern dass die auch genutzt werden können. Und ein Großteil geht ja auch in die zweite Säule für die Entwicklung ländlicher Räume. Weil ein Punkt ist ja, ist ja von allen gesagt worden, die jungen Leute wandern ab. Und das ist ein Riesenproblem. Und das hat auch viel damit zu tun, dass das in vielen Regionen keine, keine Arbeit ist, die man da leistet, die einfach ist. Sondern sie ist anstrengend, sie hat wenig ein, generiert wenig Einkommen. Und deshalb muss man gucken, wie kann man auch in diese Regionen wieder Einkommen hinbekommen. Nicht nur, dass sich dann Touristen von außen dran freuen, sondern wie kann man Tourismus in Verbindung mit einer herkömmlichen Landwirtschaft in Wert setzen. Wie kann man zum Beispiel dann auch Obstbau, jedenfalls ist das eine Sache, die bei uns in, in, in Baden-Württemberg gut läuft, da werden zum Beispiel diese alten Obstbestände genommen, um, um, wieder, um Schnaps zu brennen. Ja? Ein, ein, ein Punkt, der in vielen Regionen tatsächlich für den Tourismus einen enormen Boom hervorgerufen hat. Und so macht man zwei Sachen. Man tut das für die Biodiversität, man gibt eine Nutzung für die alten Obstbäume und man hat sozusagen eine Wertschätzung für die Region, weil man plötzlich eine Marke hat, mit der die Region sich identifiziert. Es ist gefragt worden nach Irland. Ja, man kann eigentlich in, ein, in jedem Land solche Systeme, äh, die man hat, wo kombiniert wurde zwischen Wald oder Hecken und Landwirtschaft, diese muss man fördern. Und äh, natürlich auch in Norddeutschland gibt es diese Systeme mit Hecken rund um, um, jede, um, jedes, äh, um jedes Flurstück, damit die nicht austrocknen, damit halt auch Nutzen da ist für, für Holz. Und deshalb muss man auch das sozusagen fördern. Aber wie gesagt, es liegt nicht daran, dass es zu wenig Mittel gibt. Diese Mittel sind da, auch mit relativ hohen äh, Finanzierungen aus Brüssel, mit wenig Kofinanzierung. Was meistens fehlt, sind vor Ort die Akteure. Und ich sage es auch mal ganz ehrlich, der Wille von vielen Regierungen, sich damit intensiv zu beschäftigen. Man konzentriert sich lieber auf Industrieprojekte, man schafft und meint man mit Industrieansiedlung schafft man Arbeitsplätze. Und deshalb hat es zur Folge, nicht nur in Griechenland, nicht nur in Portugal, in vielen Regionen, nicht nur in Rumänien, dass diese Regionen abgehängt werden von einer Entwicklung und deshalb junge Leute abwandern in Industrieregionen oder sogar in andere Länder und suchen sich Jobs, wo sie Geld verdienen. Und ich glaube, das ist ein Trend, der ist wirklich fatal, weil ich sage es nochmal, wenn wir diese ganzen alten Ressourcen verlieren, verlieren wir auch eine Menge Wissen. Die nächste Generation weiß gar nicht mehr, wie man das noch nutzt. Und ein zweiter Trend, wenn wir Kombinationsprojekte machen. Ich habe das in, in Süditalien gesehen. Da werden die alten Obstbäume, die alten Olivenbäume gefällt, zunehmend gefällt, weil sie kompliziert sind zu beernten. Und dann pflanzt man diese neuen Arten von Olivenbäumen, diese kleinen, maschinell erntbaren Olivenbäume, äh, in einer, ja, wo dann auch eine Landschaft sozusagen maschinengerecht hergerichtet wird. Und dasselbe ist auch äh, im Obstbau, dass diese Kombination, die immer da war in der Landwirtschaft, Obstbau, Nutzung durch Schafe und Ziegen, dass das wegfällt, weil diese alten Obstflächen nicht mehr da sind, weil heute Obstbau, wer Südtirol kennt, weiß, wie der Obst angebaut wird, äh, plötzlich solche völlig durchrationalisierten, sehr chemisch intensiven äh, Anbausysteme überwiegen. Und da müssen wir von wegkommen. Und deshalb äh, vielen, vielen Dank für die wirklich sehr interessanten Vorträge. Ich habe echt was gelernt, muss ich wirklich sagen, hat mich äh, bereichert. Und äh, ich bin gern bereit, äh, noch mal dass wir dann nochmal in, in die Thematik einsteigen und äh, dass wir auch schauen, dass wir aus den GAP-Mitteln genügend Mittel frei machen können, sowohl für die zweite Säule, für solche Projekte, aber auch für andere regionale Projekte. Und ich, wir müssen auch regionale Projekte der GAP kombinieren mit Regionen, mit regionalen Projekten, die sagen, aus anderen Fonds kommen. Auch das ist halt wichtig, damit wir sagen, nicht eine Maßnahme so entwickeln, die nächste dagegen, sondern dass wir das alles kombinieren. Und am Ende müssen wir es schaffen, dass da wir in diesen Regionen 
Bauern und Menschen in diesen Regionen eine Perspektive geben. Und da reicht meistens nicht nur eine Maßnahme, sondern da brauchen wir viele Maßnahmen, kluge Köpfe, kluge Ideen. Und ich, das habe ich heute genügend von gesehen. Das bin ich also ganz hoffnungsfroh, dass wir das zumindest aufhalten können oder in eine andere Richtung drehen können. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm really sorry that you have to leave. But uh, again, it's very important that uh, you raise the social uh, part of this issue. And this is the rural depopulation. It's really a huge problem that uh, has not uh, been tackled, uh, let's say. And it needs to many different resources uh, that uh, would make the rural living more attractive. Thank you very much, and uh, I will um, pa uh, go on with uh, some small uh, questions. Um, we do not have so many, so I would uh, say that Michalis Vrachnakis could uh, probably uh, answer the very, very nice uh, uh, question uh, about the Uh, uh, who has been posed by uh, uh, Mr. Emin, Emin Sotea, who, who has been in Karditsa also. And he is asking about the collaborative system of working the land and uh, sharing things. So could you please uh, make a comment on this, uh, Michali? Yeah, actually, I was... Uh, I, was uh, I wrote the answer <laughs> because uh, I didn't know if I have enough time. But anyway, I will, uh, I will answer. Yes, of course, I would suggest uh, such cooperative management. Um, men and women are part of the rural landscapes and uh, any intervention uh, we like to have, we must include the human dimension. Uh, but to do so, it is quite important to raise the hesitation of farmers to adopt agroforest as an activity that will significantly increase of their income in medium term. It's important, this point is very important. Uh, because uh, farmers are quite suspicious about the adoption of agroforestry. So it is, uh, it is an issue that we must overcome to firstly overcome this issue and then to create such cooperative management. And the other part of the question was about the applied research. Yes, applied research has already showed uh, the ecosystem benefits that agro-systems can provide to society. Uh, it is important so that it's not our business to include in their portfolio all these activities that support the landscape regeneration and accordingly ecosystem service provision. It is very important. Yes, uh, applied research has, al has already uh, given us answers on this. And it is up to regional authorities to create, to establish such, uh, uh, such uh, initiatives, such a regional business, and to include all these activities that support landscape regeneration. Thank you very much for the question. And I'm happy <laughs> that you were uh, at least once in Karvica. I hope to see you in Karvica again. <laughs> Okay, uh, as I was also a speaker and I see some uh, questions that could be answered by me, I would uh, answer, uh, uh, could you please give me uh, <laughs> the uh, one, two minutes to answer uh, the question about biodiversity and then uh, an anonymous has uh, also um, asked about how do we ensure the solution is a protective enhancement and not a degradation? And uh, this is, uh, uh, my answer will combine these two, but the, 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 the case in Ireland uh, and the case in Cork, uh, which both uh, the one with hedgerows and the other with the Asian native woodlands uh, have been damaged uh, because of uh, some payments. Uh, I would say that uh, biodiversity, uh, because we live the two main crises this time of the, uh, of the uh, we are entering a very, a very dark, probably, uh, period, and we have 
to tackle both crises, the global biodiversity crisis and the global climate change. So both, we want both to, to do something for both of them. And I don't see any reforestation or forestation or planting that has not taken a, a, a seriously in account the biodiversity crisis. If we are uh, going to plant eucalyptus trees in flammable landscapes, we don't uh, do really reforestation. We, de we do silly things. We do things that we have been done again in the past and have been uh, proved to be destructive for the natural environment. Biodiversity should be all over horizontally in all the pillars and all uh, payments should be taken seriously in, uh, in account. And this is uh, so uh, that because we have seen, especially in the Mediterranean, that agroforestry systems do not only support biodiversity, but they support a species unique for those agroforestry landscapes, especially when they are, uh, uh, when, for example, ancient trees are, uh, are within them. So biodiversity, uh, we don't speak about uh, reforestation or productive reforestation without speaking about the need for economically viable landscapes, either ancient or modern ones. And of course, biodiversity should be the, the, the thing that will judge if we want to go on or with this or we don't. And uh, especially this has to do also with the islands where, for example, the terraces are collapsing because of payments and we don't want to see that going on. This is the reason why we put also biodiversity in the title of our book, but also that we want to make this Asian landscape uh, economically viable. So uh, as a, 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 an, a, we have another uh, two, three questions, probably uh, Pandera could uh, make also a small, uh, a small note and uh, uh, about, for example, the, the uh, how we can uh, uh, we can proceed with these uh, um, payments and how we can in a national level uh, do some things because as martin said it's the 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 countries that uh, should take uh, uh, some responsibility of how they uh, handle the money that are available yeah digas um, well, it is, as I said, it's, it's a matter of policy. Michalis also said that, he pointed out. I mean, it's, it, it, in Greece, we have been uh, through also the Hellenic Agroforestry Network. We have done so many uh, meetings and we have been in contact with so many policymakers and still we have not any response so far. We, of course, we do hope that something will change. But so I think for me, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of combination of also stakeholders asking for this money and also for politicians willing, willing to hear this or realizing the importance. Because it, it's, it's quite obviously that don't, not all the politicians are farmers or uh, agronomists or foresters. And so sometimes it's not so obvious for them the importance and uh, how uh, critical it is to take some actions on that. So on, on the one side, you, we need to educate, we need to tell people that it's quite for their own interest to ask for, um, for support for their systems. And on the other hand, we also have to educate or inform the politicians about the critical situation we are right now. And they, they, they do need to take some actions because it's not only for one term, it's not only for one year, it's not for two years, it's for the future. And um, I'm, I'm teaching for a soil. So I, I, when, when the in my first class, I always tell my students that it's, it takes hundreds of years 
to make soil, but it takes only five minutes to destroy the soil. So we need to take some critical messages to everybody to understand that we are presently at a very critical point and we need to take some actions. So this is, I, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I, maybe I haven't answered directly to your, uh, to your question because it's, it's not a straightforward answer. It, it, it is, for me, it's a, uh, it, it is a spherical point and it's not just one answer. You have to take certain, a lot of actions to move forward. But again, of course, we need support because let's not, uh, I mean, I have been discussing with many livestock breeders also here in Carpenisi, in, in the mountains, Greece. And the, it, it is quite obvious that in some locations, such as here, the remote locations, uh, it's not so easy for the livestock. It, it, it's easy for me to ask for the young people to stay and keep their flocks and continue grazing and do the shepherds. But it's not for, so easy for them to stay. And uh, it's not also economic viable to stay and do some uh, any uh, keep their 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 farms. So we we have to take this into account as well. I mean, as I said in my presentation, location, where we are, wh what are the needs, what are the problems, and I think also some of the previous uh, speakers said that it's 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 an equation. It's not the straightforward answer. It's an equation. They, that needs to take a lot of parameters into account and take into and, and conclude to a viable solution and fair solution actually for everybody. So we, if we want to keep these practices, if we want to continue saving these practices, because also somebody said that it's quite important to keep this knowledge, to keep this, this wisdom, for me it's a wisdom, and uh, so if we want to take this wisdom, go uh, continue, and we have to inherit this, this wisdom to our, to our children, we have to take into account also the, these people and how these people are and what the situation they are and, and make this a, vi a viable solution. Okay, uh, I don't know if Dagmar from the organizing committee wants to make uh, also a question and then... Uh, I have only another one for Michalis Vrahnakis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rikas. But just put your question and I will do some last summary, if you please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, Michalis, um, there is a, 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 a question about uh, from uh, Yanis Kazoglu, and uh, he said something which is also interesting. Sometimes we don't understand, probably in the, some member states, they don't understand how important and how valuable is the systems that are preserved by accident or not uh, uh, because of the political will. And he said, if agroforestry measure of measures of pillar two should somehow be imposed to member states. So what is your opinion about imposing uh, 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 some uh, measures that uh, um, probably local uh, or national uh, priorities are not uh, taken in, uh, in, uh, in account? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, something that I have already think about it. Actually, this morning I was talking with a friend, with um, uh, Kostas Manzanas, and I told him that, well, Kostas, I, I'm thinking that maybe, maybe a, a directive, an EU directive about agroforestry, maybe it is important to launch because uh, this way uh, probably the member states will, uh, will be pressed to, to apply to promote agroforestry. But actually, I don't think that um, maybe uh, the directive is something very, very serious to, to say. But anyway, uh, I don't know how to do it. Uh, maybe the first, the first step is to run some demonstration plants, some demonstration of the agroforestry in uh, rural uh, societies. Uh, and then if uh, the people, the farmers, uh, see that these uh, systems provide values, then they press uh, government. It is a, uh, a top-down, it is a bottom-up process, uh, then maybe this, the government will adopt. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, last question uh, has been uh, just uh, came up, and this is an interesting one, and has to do with uh, 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 I want uh, prob probably probably uh, Pandera will be the one who can ask the uh, answer this, and has to do with isolated pockets of Asian forest, and if we have like in Ireland, uh, the, the, the Andrew Ledger uh, is uh, asking for, but I know we have also in Greece, these isolated pockets of Asian uh, forest. And how are these, uh, if we have some examples that uh, this uh, 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 agroforestry measure could uh, 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 do something for um, preserving and connecting this Asian forest. And uh, if we have some examples of, uh, of this uh, in Europe or in Mediterranean or in Greece. Okay, well, I just typed the link to the innovation leaflets of the Ag Forward pro project. And I think that there, uh, anybody can find a lot of information of, of examples that they are experimental results, which is quite important. It's not just like I, my opinion, whatever. So we have been working for four years in, within the Forward project. So, so there many people can find even because we had similar ancient, uh, ancient uh, um, forest or in in uh, Romania also as. Uh, as have been presented to today, so there are many there are, there are many many actually uh, examples that uh, people can read and take some examples and some ideas and also there are also uh, some um, uh, emails of the people that they have been conducting the research. So if they need more information, they can go there. Yeah, uh, for for just just one comment from myself. Uh, we, if we want to apply some management, we have to look around us, as I say. I mean, what have been traditionally been practiced there? So it's not like what I'm doing here in Greece, it, it's applicable in Ireland or in Romania, but I'm pretty sure that there has been some wisdom, some, been some, some traditional practices, some traditional uh, uh, ways that people have been doing there. And I know because I have been in Ireland, I have visited Ireland, and um, I was, uh, we were, the locals have presented us some traditional practices there. So I'm pretty sure that there are some answers there, but it's not that what I'm doing here in Greece is applicable in Ireland. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Thank you very much for uh, the answer. Uh, yes, there are examples everywhere, but probably small projects, but uh, there are examples. And uh, we don't see the willingness, the, these examples, to expand. And uh, I would say that uh, even if we, uh, NGOs, for example, or local people are pressing uh, for the preservation of landscapes, for the cultural heritage, for the biodiversity, for the importance of uh, tackling the desertification erosion problem, or the importance for honey production, or the importance of non-timber product uh, production. All these uh, stakeholders, if they combine, I would say, uh, forces, then we will see probably policy making, changing, and uh, towards this that we say multifunctional and uh, multifunctional uh, agroforestry, which is also the common from uh, uh, attendee. So, uh, Dagmar, we already have uh, been uh, late, 20 minutes. Uh, and so, do you want to end up this, uh, this nice event, uh, making a final comment? Sehr herzlichen Dank, Rigas. Sehr herzlichen Dank euch allen. Ich kann an Martin anschließen. Ich habe heute Abend sehr, sehr viel gelernt. Uh, und mir ist auch eines sehr präsent und bewusst und das erfüllt mich trotz allem mit großer Zuversicht und Freude. Uh, wenn wir über solche Themen sprechen, wenn wir über Klimawandel sprechen, uh, dann kommen wir sehr rasch auf den Boden und zwar auf unserem Boden, auf unsere Wurzeln. 
äh, es ist ganz, ganz wichtig, dass wir das Land schützen, auf dem und in dem wir leben. Und insofern, ja, äh, jede äh, Maßnahme, um unser Klima zu schützen, muss auch von einer sozialen Maßnahme flankiert oder begleitet werden. Auch das hat Martin angesprochen. Wir sprechen nicht zuletzt von einer sozial-ökologischen Transformation. Das alles muss auch immer im Hinblick auf die Lebensrealität der Menschen abgestimmt sein. Wir wollen alle ein gutes Leben und das bedeutet aber auch, dass wir von dem, was wir tun, tatsächlich leben können. Und ich glaube hier, so wie du das auch jetzt angesprochen hast, Rigas, ist es einfach notwendig, dass wir alle zusammenstehen und auch nicht locker lassen. Ja, es braucht jeden Einzelnen von uns, es braucht NGOs, die hier die Bürger und Bürgerinnen unterstützen und auch Druck machen auf die Politik. Die Politik ist gerne bequem, das wissen wir alle, und geht den leichtesten Weg oder auch den Weg des Geldes. Aber das ist nicht immer der Vorteil für uns alle. Und insofern ist es notwendig, Druck zu machen, und einfach dran zu bleiben. Und was mir wahnsinnig gefallen hat, Anastasia, waren auch deine Beispiele. Es hat mich vieles erinnert an die kleinräumige Landwirtschaft hier bei uns in Mitteleuropa, in meiner Heimat, in Österreich. Die Unterschiede sind nicht so groß. Und ich glaube, wenn wir alle am gleichen Strang ziehen, dann kommen wir auch einen Schritt weiter. Esheristopoli, Michalis, das waren ganz großartige Inputs von Ihnen. Hat mich wahnsinnig gefreut, auch Uh, an Sie, Anastasia, ja, bleibt mir nur noch zu sagen, ich hoffe und wir werden dieses Thema weiter lancieren und fortsetzen und ich hoffe euch sehr bald entweder bei euch zu Hause in Griechenland besuchen zu können oder euch zu unserer Veranstaltung im Herbst hier einladen zu dürfen. Uh, ja, adios, habt noch einen schönen Abend und weitermachen. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank also all the attendees that they pose these ni nice and interesting questions. I want also to, uh, to, to, to say, say a big thank you to the organizing committee, also to uh, Klaus Mers, who was uh, in the backstage together with Andrian Doth, who supported the whole project and the whole work, and to the other people that they make also the the Greek English translation and to all the organizing committee and hope you hope see you again in the next event because probably we will present our book in Greek and in in English the book about reforestation the productive reforestation and the revival of the living rural landscapes with through agroforestry measures um, in the next uh, probably meeting. We have no idea when, but uh, surely we will uh, come again uh, <laughs> on this interesting issue. Thank you very much for attending. Goodbye. Goodbye.